Daniel Aikiju has a request. Please stop talking about the violence in Islam. It is only 5% of our religion. It's interesting how when a conversation is about Islam, we focus on that 5% instead of the 95% of what Islam is about. That is a lot of violence, my friend. But we're Christians filled with the abundant love of God. So let's be generous and grant Daniel's request. Let's take a deep look at the other 95% and learn what Islam is all about. We're now going to figure out what the other 95% of Islam is. Intercourse so, with your underage wife. Now, let's assume <laughs> that our underage wife is a very plump wife who is able to withstand the weight of a man at a nice early age of six. Now, in a lot of countries, if you are an adult of, say, 30 or 40 or 50, you can't have intercourse with someone who is under the age of 18. So that would give us 12 years of underage intercourse between our six-year-old bride and her 40-whatever-year-old group. This will be his first wife. And of course, in Islam, the needs of a husband are considered to be extraordinarily high. So high, in fact, that women are not allowed to fast without the permission of their husbands. Because between the sunset to sunset during the day, a man might need to have intercourse with his wife. So we're going to assume very high levels of libido, just as Muhammad is. So let's say 20 minutes every single day for 365.25 days a year. So uh -huh. for the 12 years. So we have 1,460 hours of <laughs> underage intercourse with first wife. Now, after she turns 18, perhaps you might want another. But then you have to split your time between two wives. So your second wife that you marry, if she <laughs> only gets half as much intercourse while she is underage. So we're following the Sunnah that Muhammad lays out for Muslims. Mm -hmm. We're talking about what is in Islam, ah, not okay. what not, not, not what people actually Muslims do. Gotcha. to the standard of what Muslims actually do, but rather what they should do. Yeah, that, that's a good point there, because obviously the average Muslim does not commit 27,000 hours of violence in their lives. So let's distinguish what they can do by Muhammad's permission and what they actually do. Okay, you were asking what the 95% that's not killing is in Islam? Mm -hmm. One of the primary things is plunder, that is theft. When at the Hijra, the Muslims moved to Medina, Muhammad doesn't tell them okay, now you're going to have to start selling stuff and operating farms and shops and making a living. The only thing that he tells them to do is raid the caravans of the Arab tribes in the area. So plunder, theft, is the livelihood of the Muslims. And then that extends to the period after Muhammad when the Muslims are conquering everywhere and forcing the non-Muslims, as per the Quran, to pay the jizya and to be responsible for the upkeep of the Muslims. This continues to this day. In uh, Europe, there was even an imam a few years ago who said that you can mug the infidels and steal from them because they're not paying the jizya as they're supposed to, and they owe you your living. So you can lawfully take what is theirs. And so plunder is the means of livelihood in the ideal Islamic state and in the time of Muhammad. Since this is going to be their full-time wage, ah. let's do standardized 2,000-hour work week. We need not make them work too much. So standardized work weeks in which you are defrauding or plundering or otherwise letting the people that you are jihading against roughly in that 5% of the time so that they understand that they're subdued and that they are subject to you. We will just call that plunder slash work because this is a means of livelihood. <laughs> Excellent. Sure, we'll keep on with this sort of trend since Robert Spencer started with uh, plundering. We'll go ahead and go on to slavery, primarily beating slaves. Would be something you find quite a bit in the sources, Al Daoud 1818, where Muhammad is smiling while his father-in-law is beating a slave. And even Muhammad makes a bit of a joke while that goes on. It kind of goes flat, but 
I try as a joke, at least. Slave beating in general does not take up an enormous amount of your time. And so I would say that it's perhaps only 10 minutes a day spent beating your slaves. I think that that's fairly reasonable. And you might not have your first slave till you're 20. It really depends. So let's go from age 20 onward, 20 minutes a day. Let's highlight ritualistic prayer, because this is one of the things that Daniel wants us to, to talk about. He, he says that this is a very important part of Islam. And as we know, Muslims are obligated to spend several uh, periods of time during each day with ritualistic prayer. And if they're not doing this, they are not true Muslims. And it doesn't matter if they want to do it. It doesn't matter if they feel connected to God or anything. It's completely ritualistic. You say the magic words and you're good. So it should be very easy to calculate how much time is spent in the five daily prayers. Maybe we'll throw in some of the optional prayers. I don't know, but I know Mary already has the calculation up here on the screen for us. So you want to explain well, the calculation? This is just telling you how many repetitions of prayer you must do. The first five prayers that are required prayers, the last prayer is your bonus prayer it is not necessarily something that you do. The part in red is the required part of every prayer if you do that prayer. And then there are other ones that are highly recommended that you have to do. If you do some of them, you absolutely have to do others. And it's, it's an entire thing. Now, are we going to have absolute minimal Muslim who does the least possible, or are we going to have someone who does all the recommended prayers, but in a perfunctory manner. We should go with a very pious Muslim, because, you know, they're following the example of Muhammad. He was sub supposedly very famous for all of his extra prayers. Now, doing all the extras, but the absolute minimum of, the, of all the extras, we get... Oh, and you see that is the largest number other than plunder that we have so far. So you see that Islam is very good. There, there's a lot of praying going on in Islam. I would like to go ahead and take sleeping because all right. we know that all human beings sleep and sleeping is going to be an important part of Islam. Now, however, you aren't supposed to sleep as much as other people. So I'm going to say seven and a half hours. As a child, you'd sleep more and, you're, and the sleep deprivation is supposed to be beneficial to you onwards. In Surah 2, Ayah 230, that if you divorce your wife three times, she is not lawful to you again unless she goes and remarries and sleeps with that man and then gets divorced, then she can return to her husband. That is in the Quran. It actually doesn't take that much time to divorce because all you have to do is say or imply divorce three times and you're divorced. For example, my husband, when we first married before God transformed his life, had a really bad temper and uh, Jesus delivered him from that, praise God. But in anger, a husband says to lock, to lock, to lock. <laughs> Although my husband likes to joke, it's, was it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, but do I divorce you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do, I no. divorce. <laughs> so because of a husband speaking rashly with his words, Islam's just the gift that keeps on giving to women. It's the wife who has to pay the price and then go sleep with another man if she wants to keep her family together and be, you know, a mother to her children. So this is a man's life. You know, he doesn't really care about the three months that his wife has to spend before she's even free to engage in halala marriage. Let us say that it takes approximately 24 hours of your time and effort and your thinking about it and everything else. And so I will give it 24 hours dedicated to this thrice divorced woman who's then brought back through intercourse to another man and remarried. All right. I thought that she should include the Ida period, but Mary made a persuasive argument that women don't really matter here, and we're only looking at the man, so 24 hours it is. Robert, you're up. Well, you got to eat. you got to put that in, and you have to make <laughs> sure you're not eating any pork and, uh, or suing people if they're giving you pork secretly, which seems to happen quite often. Anyway, you have to eat one way or the other. Indeed you do. And in fact, I would put in the scamming the restaurant into their working hours. So I don't <laughs> think we can double dip there. Now you would think that because of Ramadan, that they would actually spend less time eating than other people. But that isn't really true because during Ramadan, they have nightly feasts and spend far longer eating than any normal person would in a given time during the day. Because Ramadan is in fact what we call trans fasting. It is where you identify as fasting, even though you are actually feasting every day. And so I will give it approximately one hour, you know, one and a half hours of actually eating per day. He doesn't have to worry about cooking because, of course, when he married his six-year-old, he made sure to train in cooking as well as being plump before he married her. 
All right. Intercourse with young boys is a frequent aspect of Islamic culture. I think that spending time with dancing boys dressed as women is a part of almost every Islamic society. And uh, also the grooming of certain boys in the village from the ages of about 12 to 16 that they're, they're used by the other men of the village. That is incredibly common. And in fact, people talk about how they fought in Afghanistan. And if you look out at any village on a given night using night goggles, that you would find men meeting up with boys. So I think that that would certainly go into the Islamic norms. Now you are spending 20 minutes a day with your wife. However, again, because your sexual impulses are so at the forefront of Islam, we, we shall assume that our gentleman has a very vigorous libido here. So let us say that three nights a week, he also has the time to go out from the age of 14 onward to go out and enjoy boys as well. Or we'll, we'll give him 60. We'll give him 60. How about that? <laughs> Sure, sure. And I wanted to highlight asking forgiveness because this is something that Muhammad did. Depending on the Hadith, if you look at Sahih Bukhari 6307, it says, I ask forgiveness from Allah and turn to him in repentance more than 70 times a day. If you look at other Hadith, we find out that more than 70 means around 100 times. For example, Sunan Ibn Majah 3815, the Messenger of Allah said, I seek the forgiveness of Allah and repent to him 100 times each day. So I think that maybe it takes one minute or so. And I mean, if he's doing it 70 times a day, it's obviously not very long. Actually, if you do all of that, it works out to only an additional about 10 minutes a day with all of these recipes. Oh, really? I was going to yeah. give him 100 minutes a day, but apparently it's only no, 10 no, it's, minutes because a Because every time you say, I seek refuge with Allah, I seek refuge with Allah, I seek refuge with Allah, that, that counts as part of it. But there are all sorts of invocations that you should say. To keep up with this rigorous schedule, we need to keep our bodies healthy. Like when a fly falls in our soup, we have to make sure to dunk it because the curse is on one wing, the blessings on another. So that is in the Hadith. Uh, mustn't forget, Muhammad encouraged us to suck people's fingers after lunch because there is hidden blessing on that. Let's make sure we keep our bodies healthy. Cheers to Muhammad. Yeah, I think following all the prophetic medicine and the advice following things like that would take quite a bit of time. And I remembered my other one. It's reciting Surah Al-Baqarah in order to keep shaitans from coming in your house every day. So you <laughs> now, maybe your wife will do this a lot of the time because this is usually a wifely duty. However, we did marry our child bride at six and so she never went to school and although it is permissible to send out your wife for islamic education we'll assume that she's kept nice and ignorant the way daniel hakikachu has talked about how he has mocked the girls for crying because they can't go to school anymore so clearly daniel hakikachu is among those who believe that women should not be educated after the time that they are married off which should be indeed as young as humanly possible all right. Robert, you're up. Well, I believe, if I recall correctly, there were only two wives. So doesn't this guy need a couple more wives? you got to make deals with the other people, the other men in the village for who you're going to be marrying, you know, which one of their daughters you're going to be mm, marrying and so on, and what you're going to pay. That's going to take some time. I've been at those meetings. That takes a lot of time. So there you go. you got to add in a chunk of time for that. Mary is going to put 80 hours of negotiation times four wives. I think that's fair. Your brother in Christ, you're up. Um, the next logical progression would be the sex lives. Both male and female, you get the opportunity to enjoy. After all, Muhammad was kissed all over his body by men. The process, and it's very clear in Sunnah al Dayud that you are allowed to take women as slaves whenever it refers to those your right hands possess. They are referring to sex slaves. So this is something that we know for a fact was quite prevalent within early Islamic history and even till today. Slave trade for those sex slaves really overshadows the American slave trade by huh, quite a margin, put it in the least. And how they were treated were quite horrendous. Their children were considered unclean, so you didn't have to worry about having unwanted heirs they would just kill them off because their skin was black. So therefore they were unclean and prepared for hell. I believe Mary's putting in a computation for the intercourse with those your right hand possesses. I'm ready for my next one. Can you guess what it is? 
you have to kill the black dogs because they're the devil. I think right? it should go separately because uh, Daniel well, is objecting to killing of human beings, and a dog is definitely not a human being. I would say you would spend no more than an hour a week doing that. Close your ears. Maybe from age seven onward. Don't I don't know. Me. It's It can be hard to catch them once they know they're going to be killed. <laughs> Almost like they don't like it to be killed, you know? I know. So, you so far have put intercourse with your underage wives, but we, we definitely have to get intercourse with your of-age wives as well. As we know, uh, Muhammad would go around and have sex with all nine or eleven of his wives in one night and taking only one bath. So we can assume that a Muslim following the Sunnah will have intercourse with all four of his wives. Remember that Muhammad himself did have the strength of many men. And so this was a special thing for him. So I don't think that it's going to be right to say that our jihadi is going to be able to average more than intercourse twice a day, once with either a boy or a slave girl, and once with one of his wives every single day. Mohammed had a special privilege that he was allowed to go around to all of his wives. And while he could theoretically go around to all of his slave girls, he cannot go all around to all of his wives because his wives are actually owed unique time with him each night. Uh, Balrudder said, I did the math, and Muhammad prayed for forgiveness something like every 12 to 15 minutes. Seems like Muhammad was doing a lot of sins, and he needed to ask forgiveness so often. Such a shame that the perfect example who was completely sinless actually sinned at least every 12 to 15 minutes. Not according to my standards, by his own standards, which a lot of the things that he wouldn't consider sins, I absolutely would. So, Mary, it looks like you got hours memorizing the Quran on there. Yeah, so the Quran notoriously flees from the heart of men like nothing else. And every really excellent Muslim would become a hafiz and would, would memorize all of the Quran. So we would expect our guys to have memorized the entirety of the Quran and to even practice Surah Al-Baqarah takes an hour. And if you don't practice regularly, you're going to forget it. You have to, to make it through the whole of the Quran in a week. I forgot to mention that, of course, memorizing the Quran includes memorizing all of the beautiful details of violence and so on. So we'll say you spend the time memorizing the Quran that equals an entire week's recitation of the Quran. As we know in Islam, uh, children are disciplined for not properly memorizing the Quran. So it definitely is something that people spend a lot of time on. Um, Balrudder said some Muslims spend a lot of time on it. Others seemingly never read it. Average the two. And no, uh, we're doing what the ideal Muslim does here. Because we're, we're talking about what you find in Islam, not in the lives of Muslims. So ideally, the Muslim spends a lot of time memorizing it, even though many Muslims have never read the Quran because they're not great Muslims. Spending time beating your four wives, which I would remind you as far as the time calculations go, do remember that you beat your wives less than you beat your slaves, at least a good Muslim would. So you can subtract like one second from the beating your slaves thing and you're perfectly fine. I did include the time that you need to scold your wives because you need to scold as well as beat your wives. That's so true. I split the beating of wives across the four wives and then doubled it for scolding time as well. And that's found in Quran 4, 34. And then the second one would be, of course, once you're done beating her, you need to dress up to uh, be more pious like Muhammad. So you might as well dress up in her underwear. So that reference is Sahih al-Bukhari. 2581. Cross-dressing, just like the Prophet Muhammad himself. And we do have someone who actually had a childhood, so we need to add in those hours of school and mm. just being a child but not being asleep. As you can see from our calculation, we are nearing the end of this, which is great. We have covered most of the things in Islam, but we are missing one very important thing, I think, and that would be time spent during the prayer service on Friday, learning about how evil non-Muslims are. Because the vast majority of these, the time spent in their you know, prayer service is spent, according to Muslims I've talked to, according to my very limited experience, attending services, uh, most of this time is spent on, not on sermons, on, you know, good things in Islam or how to live your life, but on cursing or explaining why Allah hates the unbelievers. So we could attribute maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes a week for your entire life would cover that. We're down to just a couple thousand hours remaining here. Mary, do you have something you'd like to add? Well, we do have the other general pious activities, such as spending time in the mosque. We also have the Hajj 
which yes. is going to take many hours in the time that mm -hmm. it takes. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that we can just like kind of sum up what this this remaining time is for. We have like Hajj, we have Umrah, we have staying in mosque, we have other. Yeah, Markfish suggests hunting and killing and, and cursing wizards. That's probably only a few hours. I mean, in fairness. <laughs> yeah. It, oh, yeah. And I forgot that. I think that that could probably be wrapped into killing dogs and lizards or geckos. So, the Hajj is uh, going to be once in your lifetime for an obedient Muslim. That would only be, uh, let's say, 500 hours or something, you know, all the time preparing for it and going on. And some of that is sleeping. So it would really be less, 300 hours, perhaps. You know, we can adjust our calculations and post the, the final number later on. But I think we, we've come to a pretty good measure of what you find in Islam. But as you can see, the most important thing in Islam is sleeping. So we're completely hypocritical because we spend all of our time talking about violence and not about how Islam teaches you to sleep. But then we see that the second most important thing in Islam is the hours spent working. And if you're following the Sunnah of Muhammad, you'll spend those working hours in plunder because this is the way that his people made their living. They started by robbing the unarmed caravans and then later, shockingly, started to arm those. And as his army grew, they started to do it through offensive jihad, but not, not the killing, not the killing, you know, just the stealing, just the stealing. And if you're properly following it, that will be number two on your list. And then number three, as we can see, is memorizing the Quran. That makes perfect sense to me. Now, memorizing the Quran doesn't mean understanding the Quran. It doesn't mean studying. It means pointlessly reciting, learning to recite a bunch of words that you don't necessarily even understand what they mean. That's better for the rest of society, because if they could understand it, then they would know more clearly what Islam teaches and would adhere even better to the patterns laid forth by the initial generation, the Salafi and the Sahaba, who are the pattern for all mankind. And the reason that you need to spend all the time memorizing the Quran is so that you can get the magical benefits of the various surah, which are different from each other. So certain things you recite for certain benefits, and then other things you recite for other benefits. So the importance of memorizing the Quran is often for all of these magical benefits, including the fact that they will become animate on the day of judgment and testify on your behalf that you recited them. And so they will become your intercessors. So we will wrap up shortly, but I do want to give Muslims the opportunity to call in and dispute our calculations. Look at all those zeros. No love, no humility, no care for non-Muslims, no prayer to the true God, and certainly no relationship with him. No studying, no thinking, nothing but Muhammad. Does this sound like the true religion to you? Well, if you aren't convinced yet, Let's go ahead and take a deep look at what that 5% violence actually means in this video here.